Ireland, an island of contrasting beauty. Here, on the very fringe of Europe, the rugged Atlantic coastline gives way to a land of greenery, fertility and life. This is a place with an identity all of its own, both physically and culturally, a land of mist and magic that delights visitors from all over the world. Ireland is a land with an ancient past, an ancient Celtic past. It was 1,500 years ago that St. Patrick arrived here, bringing the word of Christ to a people already centuries old. St. Patrick's mission was ultimately successful and his status is secure as one of the greatest figures of Irish legend. But the arrival of Christianity did not eliminate altogether the old ways of life in Ireland. The Celtic tradition lived on. By reading the surviving sagas of Irish Celtic literature, we can see that St. Patrick is just one of the legendary figures of old Ireland. The stories of great heroes such as Cahulin and Finn McCool are still told today, keeping alive the Celtic tradition of the Bard. These wonderful stories may be largely mythical, but there are also tales of undeniably real Celtic heroes. The struggles of Vercingetorich and Queen Boudicca also express fully the spirit of a remarkable people. It was a spirit that not even St. Patrick could quench. The man who would become patron saint of Ireland was born around 389 AD, probably in the southwest of England. We know that his family had connections with the early Christian church, although Patrick's own account of his boyhood reveals an early lack of interest in the Christian faith and a typically boyish neglect for his studies. But when he was a youth of about 14, he was taken from his home by a gang of Irish raiders who enslaved him on the island. According to legend, Patrick spent his early days in Ireland looking after his captors' livestock. It was here in the cold, dark and empty nights watching over the cattle that he is said to have learned to turn to God for help and comfort. In so doing, the young man became committed to his faith. During his time on the land, Patrick began to experience visions, urging him to escape from his captivity. After a period of some six years, he succeeded. He fled his master's farm, made his way to the coast, and departed the island of Ireland by sea. He travelled to what is now northern France, where, after calling on God for his help, he returned to the land of his upbringing. But he simply could not settle down. He felt a strange compulsion to return to the land where he had been held captive, Ireland. In preparation, he returned to France, where he received his formal training as a priest before journeying back to the Irish island. Initially, his role was that of assistant to a missionary of more senior status. But when his fellow Christian died on the road, Patrick was ordained and charged with carrying the mission alone. Landing in Strangford Lock, he established his first church in a barn given to him by the local lord, and he began to convert the local population to Christianity. It would be a difficult task, since the Irish people already possessed a deep and ancient culture with a strong spiritual element. They were Celts, a people with their own holy men, the Druids. The Druids, of course, were enormously important to the Celts, um, and their fame has come down through history. Um, it's surprising, therefore, that we don't know a great deal about them. What we can gather about the Druids is that they were the repository of the law in both senses, um, law as in um, 
um, legal system and law as in um, the culture of the Celtic people. We do know that the Druids conducted religious ceremonies and um, from what we can gather, these appeared to take place in the famous oak groves. Um, we do know that the Druids, or part of the Druidic religion, centered around trees, and we still have vestiges of the Druidic tree alphabet, um, which um, to some extent is um, still associated uh, with the Gallic and the Gallic alphabet. Patrick's mission would bring him into direct conflict with the Druids and their followers. Confronted by the Christian, the Druids ordered a contest of faith, a trial of powers between Patrick and the Druid magician Lockett Moe. It was Patrick who prevailed, and Christianity began to establish itself in Ireland. But still, the crusading priest met resistance, and matters came to a head on Easter Day in 433 AD. The Christian festival coincided with the Druid Spring Festival. At this time, at the instructions of the Druids, all the fires in the land were extinguished, to be relit from the one fire burning on the hill of Tara, which was the royal residence and a profoundly sacred place. This ancient ritual symbolized the coming of spring and the rebirth of the land. Patrick chose to effect a confrontation by lighting his own Easter fire nearby. So when the High King saw this fire, he was absolutely furious and sent his officers to uh, arrest this man. But his druid said to him, Your Majesty, if we do not put out the fire of this new religion today, it will burn forever after in this land. Well, that's what happened. And uh, Patrick escaped because he quoted psalms such as some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will trust in God. And there was a thunderstorm and the king's horses panicked and fled. And uh, he had, the king had other officers at the foot of the mountain to arrest him. But all they saw was a herd of deer. And so the tradition grew that the prayer called Patrick's breastplate is the cry of the deer. Other well-known legends about Patrick are that he banished all the serpents, representing evil, from the island of Ireland. He is also said to have used the three-leaved shamrock as a way to explain the Trinity, the concept of Father, Son and Holy Ghost being one. To this day, the shamrock remains the emblem of St. Patrick and the national flower of the Irish people. Significantly, Patrick is also credited with bringing to Ireland the gift of writing. We know that Irish literacy did begin around the time of Patrick's ministry, helping to further spread the word of Christ. But the arrival of the written word achieved something else for Ireland. It helped preserve the folklore of the existing native tradition. Thanks to the efforts of modern archaeologists, we now know the origin of that tradition. It stems not from Ireland, but from Central Europe. Discoveries of ancient artifacts at locations such as Hallstatt in Austria have revealed the earliest secrets of the people who continued to flourish in St. Patrick's Island over a thousand years later, the Celts. The people of Hallstatt flourished around 700 BC a time when Europe was undergoing a technological revolution. Across the continent, iron began to replace bronze as the principal material for weapons and edged tools. The iron-using innovators of Hallstatt mark the beginning of Celtic culture, and these mysterious craftsmen are the first of the Celtic peoples. There is some mystery about the origins of but um, scholars nowadays tend to think that they originated somewhere in the region of the Indian subcontinent and by a series of migrations moved um, across Europe, through Spain, up into New Northern Europe and also by a more northerly route through um, Switzerland and into Northern Europe that way. The Celts are often portrayed as wild barbarians 
uh, the antithesis of civilized people. The problem we have here is that one of our major sources for studying the Celts is from the point of view of the Greek and Roman world looking outwards at these so-called barbarians. This is a particular problem with one of our main sources, which is, of course, Julius Caesar's own narrative of the Gallic Wars. It's the Greeks and the Romans who give us such words as barbarian and civilized, and it's arranged according to their cultural preoccupations and preconceptions. We do have a corrective to this, which is from looking at the evidence left by the Celts themselves, from the excavation of their settlements, their houses, their burials, and from the objects in them. And it's quite clear from this that the Celts, by the time of Caesar, were 